Lots of people come to Las Vegas to gamble with little pieces of hardware like these, but others come here to gamble with a different kind of hardware and software, and that gamble is called Comdex, a monster show at which computer vendors from around the world try to make it big in the PC marketplace. Today, we'll see what's new at Comdex 86 on this edition of the Computer Chronicles. The Computer Chronicles is made possible by Leading Edge, makers of IBM-compatible computer systems, including Lotus Lookalike Spreadsheet, word processing with spelling correction, communication software, and Hayes-compatible 1200 baud modem. Leading Edge, with over 1,000 service centers nationwide. Additional funding is provided by McGraw-Hill, publishers of Byte. Byte's detailed technical articles on new hardware, software, and languages cover developments in computer technology worldwide. Welcome to the Computer Chronicles. I'm Stuart Chaffe. This is Gary Kildall, and this all is Comdex. We're here at Comdex in Las Vegas, Gary, and a lot of people are saying computer conventions aren't as exciting as they used to be, and they're not as important as they used to be. You're here, though, as the CEO of Digital Research. Why do you come here? Why does a vendor come to Comdex? What do you get out of it? Well, it's really a chance to see and be seen, Stuart. The idea is you can go out there and have the customer contact, but you can also go out there and see what the competition is doing. Get some good ideas for some new products, things like that. For example, last year, uh, windowing systems are very important, things like Gem, uh, Microsoft Windows. But this year, we're finding it's the applications that are running with the windowing systems that are important. Uh, desktop publishing, for example, is a very important thing that's going on this year. Well, uh, it's just really important for the growth of our industry to have these kind of things happen. Well, we're here at Comdex in Las Vegas, and we're going to take a look at some of the newest computer goodies on show here from 386 personal computers to the new laser printers to new software packages and we'll be right back here at Comdex in Las Vegas in just a minute. biggest stories here at Comdex in more ways than one is the Intel 8386 microprocessor and the whole new generation of personal computers using the 386 chip. Of course, Compaq was first out of the gate with a 386 computer, but it's obvious here at Comdex that it has lots of company now. At first glance, it looks like the next step of the IBM cloning game, from PC to AT to 386, and almost everyone wants to be included. But this time, IBM is not in the picture and it's hard to tell just who is cloning whom. Along with Zenith, Compaq, and K-Pro, other companies are offering their own 386 versions, and they're betting on a big price advantage. Multitech Electronics, Taiwan's largest computer manufacturer, unveiled a typical model, but at a budget price, $3,995, or about $2,000 cheaper than most. The processing power of the 386 is easily demonstrated using a calculation-intensive application like this engineering design program. Running at a clock speed of 16 megahertz, the 32-bit chip is two to three times faster than 16-bit AT computers. Multitech's base system comes with one megabyte of RAM on the main board, a 40 megabyte hard disk, and IBM-compatible slots. The excitement surrounding the 386 could turn to gloom for AT owners who appear to be facing an expensive new upgrade. But Intel, the source of the 386 chip, is offering an alternative solution. What inboard 386 lets you do is, if you're an AT user, it allows you to upgrade your system to be a 386 system. 386 inboard allows you to add that processor in and, in essence, create a whole new machine. The introduction of the 386 microprocessor raises the desktop micro very close to the level of a mini computer, a breakthrough for power users. But it also raises other issues like software compatibility and obsolescence. Well, fortunately, the way that the Intel processor family has been designed, everything that runs on the original IBM PC will also run on your 386 machine. Of course, we can't promise that all the software that comes out for the 386 will run on that first PC but uh, that's progress. The, a lot of the new software will require the new machines, but certainly all the investment that they have in training and support and familiarity with their existing software, where the real investment is, in my opinion, will not be obsoleted by the new machines. And that's, that's the right perspective. 
On a more basic level of PC cloning, Korean manufacturers were showing XT and AT substitutes at some very attractive prices. Samsung Electronics, producing everything from semiconductors to CRTs, introduced an XT clone with a retail price under $800. Samsung's own AT clone would sell for less than $2,000. Computers competed for space with cars at the Hyundai booth, where the company's successful venture into the automobile market served as a symbol of its future computer plans. In a show of marketing bravado, Hyundai plans to sell its blue chip line of IBM compatibles through discount stores and mass merchandisers. We have a unique approach in that sense. We view that the personal computer is being regarded as a sort of a household item which cannot be that much differentiated in terms of functions and so forth. So we took that particular segment for that approach. Hyundai is another large industrial conglomerate producing a wide spectrum of electronic components. In the past, these parts have been going into other computers, but now they'll be going into the company's own products. I think the market we are trying to serve is that the market that had not been well served by the other uh, you know, competitors, like particularly from Japan and European sources, uh, somehow they did not take that aggressive approach in the before. Maybe they have some cost uh, production problem. And uh, so we believe that uh, this will not pose any direct competition with them. In fact, uh, this is the area that we feel that we can do far better in terms of the ability to uh, provide low-cost product, particularly in such a you know, time that the Japanese yen has been so appreciated. From the People's Republic of China came yet more clones, but these featured some highly unusual software. <laughs> We are mainly this time we are bringing our software with the acupuncture and also the recipes to uh, mainly look after the health of the other the, 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 the foreign people. The Beijing Guangzhou Computer Center hopes to attract attention with its acupuncture and culinary software, which can read and display in both Chinese and English. The computers are available in all modern configurations, including an 8286 version with an 80 megabyte hard disk, a local area network, and you can even get a Chinese character spreadsheet. If there was any sign of visible progress at Comdex, it was in the portable computers on display, which for the first time had visible displays. Thanks largely to some giant leaps in LCD technology, Zenith, NEC, and DataView introduced a new generation of laptop portables with sharp, bright screens. The Zenith Z181 was one of the first machines offering the so-called super twist, or birefringent liquid crystal displays. The result is a crisp blue-on-white screen with a 12 to 1 contrast ratio, about four times better than a conventional LCD. To overcome the added weight and bulk of the new portables, the DataView company cut its computer in half. The DataView Snap comes in two parts, the main unit with keyboard, CPU, and external ports, and the floppy disk unit, which can also be fitted with a hard disk drive. The two halves are connected by an infrared beam. Hopefully, Snap users will make sure they take the right half before they go out the door. NEC's entry in the new generation of portables was a slim, compact machine with a bright, sharp screen and impressive processing power. The NEC Multispeed runs off the company's own V30 microprocessor at either 4.77 or 9.54 megahertz, faster than many desktop units. It also features two 3.5-inch drives, and it weighs in about 11 pounds. Unfortunately for laptop fans, second-generation hardware comes with second-generation prices. Most of these units retail for about $2,000. This year's Comdex was also a showcase for desktop publishing, relying on the usual Macintosh or PC, a laser printer, and page description software. Increasingly, manufacturers are packaging these elements together and selling them as units. Hewlett Packard unveiled a system based on Ventura software. It offers a high-resolution color screen, Mac-like interface, and HP's own LaserJet printer. Compatibility is not restricted to clones of IBM architecture. Laser printer clones were everywhere, and while most companies seem stuck on the same basic internal design, at least the prices are dropping. 
Okidata presented a $2,200 machine with 15 resident fonts and up to 512K of memory. The laser line is compatible with the HP LaserJet and IBM software. QMS, which built one of the first low-cost machines, moved into the high-end with its 800 Plus machine, incorporating the now standard PostScript language, 35 typefaces and 2 megabytes of RAM. Three new NEC printers use laser technology, but in a different way. The silent writers direct the light beam through an array of LEDs, eliminating the mechanically rotating mirror of most other printers. Well, in a conventional laser printer, you have a single point of light source that scans across the page, and reflected by a rotating mirror. And in this way, the uh, laser is turned on or off to put a dot on a particular location. In the LED array technology, you have an array of LEDs across the page, some 2,600 of them, each aimed at a particular location on the paper. Uh, and so instead of scanning across the paper when you're printing, the LED fires as the paper passes by. More frugal desktop publishers met at the crowded Atari booth. The software vendors were promoting budget price publishing packages for Atari's ST computer. Graphics showed a $300 CAD package, while the British firm Mirrorsoft unveiled publishing software for under $200. But the winner of the low-priced game was another British company, Excellent Software, with a publishing package for under $50. Advances in mass storage took some of the spotlight at Comdex, shared about evenly between magnetic and optical media. Toshiba presented an 800 megabyte optical write once drive conforming to the new international 130 millimeter standard size. In a show of confidence in the future of optical storage, Philips of Holland has teamed up with Control Data to form the Laser Magnetic Storage Corporation. On display were some of the fruits of this cooperative venture, including a 20 disc library jukebox for people with serious data storage problems. Each 12 inch disc holds two gigabytes for a total of 40 gigabytes in all. Laser Magnetic is also promoting the cartridge idea for CD-ROMs, as in this half-height drive the company was offering, the compact unit fits into a regular five and a quarter inch floppy drive slot. On the software side, DeLorme mapping systems showed a natural CD-ROM application, Maps. One 600 megabyte disc holds a database of maps of the entire globe. The user can choose between different scales by placing the cursor over the desired spot or by entering latitude and longitude coordinates. We'll have more from Comdex in just a moment. of hype and gimmicks here at Comdex, and it's hard to sort through the inventions that will never see the light of day, and those that signify the next great trend. And it's especially difficult in the area of data storage devices. Here, for instance, is a promising new technology from Konica. Konica has made a standard five and a quarter inch floppy disk capable of storing up to 10 megabytes of data. That's the equivalent of 800,000 typewritten pages, or 10 times the amount of data that can be stored on a standard diskette. Konica has obtained eight patents on the new technology. It's referred to as an embedded servo position information system. And it's a, a technique for placing pieces of magnetic information on the diskette, intermixed with data, so that you can have a much higher resolution of head positioning. The question is, can the product be positioned so that it becomes the next standard? That's a question that Toshiba is also asking, as it offers a system for storing up to four megabytes of data on the newer three and a half inch diskette. This is accomplished using what's called perpendicular recording. Toshiba is the first manufacturer in the world to offer this new technique commercially. Puma sets the pace with the latest in computer and fitness technology. We assign computer specialists and fitness experts to design a shoe with an electronic device capable of communicating with a computer. 
That's right. This is the world's first computerized running shoe. In the back of the shoe is a tiny microprocessor that registers foot strikes and has a little timer. Once you're finished running, you plug your shoe into a PC loaded with special software and learn your progress. Here, our runner did a tenth of a mile in two and a half minutes, expending 13 calories. There are 17 million runners in the United States. 12 million of which have been uh, deemed as being very serious competitive runners. And for people who train a lot and who need accurate information, I think there uh, is a spot out there for this type of product. The Puma computer shoe is selling big in Canada, but has just been introduced in the United States. Natural speech recognition is available at speech systems. The words just spoken have gone into a microprocessor called the phonetic engine. This new device can change phonemes, or the smallest units of sound that make up human speech, into text. Possibilities for this technology are as limitless as the imagination. And finally, Comdex provided a glimpse of the video storage of the future. This system is called PC Movie Maker. Employing a high-capacity optical disk drive from Optitech, this PC is also installed with special database software and peripheral cards for video and stereo audio processing. Basically the idea is that using the IBM PC to record the audio video information and our database program, you can record hours of material per optical disc and have that at your fingertips with no need for re tape rewind or tape fast forwarding and with absolutely no tape wear because this is a disc-based system, which is a permanent medium. The, the expense, though, might prohibit a lot of people from buying it, wouldn't it? Uh, well, at under $10,000 for the board set, there's no equivalent anywhere. And our direction is to bring the price further down uh, and make it available for the consumer market. Those were some of the surprises at Comdex. It'll be interesting to see in a few years how many of these devices have become a part of our lives. For the Computer Chronicles, I'm Wendy Woods. Back in the studio here in California, now that Comdex is over with several experts to talk about the significance of what went on at Comdex, let me introduce our guests. First of all, Tim Baharin, the vice president of the microcomputer group at Creative Strategies. Next to Tim, Jan Lewis, president of the Palo Alto Research Group. And next to Jan is Hal Glatzer, West Coast Bureau Chief for Software News. Next to me is George Morrow, because Gary Kildall never got out of Las Vegas. I don't know what happened to him, so George is here in his place. Jan. Today, this year at, at Comdex was supposed to be the year of the 386. There were a lot of machines there, weren't there, sporting the 386 micro? There were a tremendous number of machines there. There were uh, many that were actually announced at the show, a few announced previously. Uh, the interesting thing about it is that it was sort of a defensive move. Uh, many vendors felt they had to come out and announce 386 machines uh, just for defensive reasons, to be competitive, and yet what you really see is a lot of these machines will not be shipping for some time to come yet. Really? So they're, they introduced them, but the, the ship dates are still uncertain? The ship dates are still uncertain, and um, even the ones that are shipping now are shipping in very small quantities. Yeah, and let's go beyond that. We've got the 386 machines. Is there software around to take advantage of the 386 That's machines? really the key question. At this point in time, there is no software that specifically takes advantage of the 386. Now, you can run existing applications on the 386, and what that really means is if you have a very large spreadsheet or a large database, you can get raw speed, raw power out of the machine. But the truth is that the software that will unlock the power of the 386 is quite a ways away on the horizon. What do you think? Uh, What's the timeline there? Well, think? I think the software for the 286 machine, which still hasn't caught up with the hardware, yeah. is probably mid next year. Mm -hmm. And the 386 so God is. God knows when we're going to get this. God knows when, exactly. Yeah. Tim, uh, laser printing. What would you say the action there in uh, Comdex was? Well, probably a couple areas. First of all, the whole concept of desktop publishing has gotten everybody kind of jazzed. And <clears throat> I know uh, I chaired the session on desktop publishing on Thursday, and we had 1,200 in attendance and mm -hmm. turned 400 away. And so, of course, that is something that so is driving it. So it's very that. hot. But as, it, as, as an office automation tool in general, if you went to the, the floor and tried to actually find um, 
a uh, dot, I mean a, a daisy wheel printer, you would have a hard time finding that. It's the whole concept of laser printers are definitely starting to move in the direction where they will dominate the market so shortly. Hal, you follow software. What would you say the news in software was at the show? Well, we rarely see new software products unveiled at Comdex anymore. It's just impossible to run mm -hmm. a good demonstration. Sure. And a lot of stuff that you do see isn't really ready. Sure. But since I follow a uh, larger system and large organization purchase type of software, what I'm noticing is that everyone with an established application now has a local area network version. Mm -hmm. Everyone wants to run on networks, and it happened that I chaired a session on local area networks, and it brought out quite a lot of people who need to supply complete systems and complete solutions to businesses, mostly medium to large size businesses, and they all want to run their favorite applications in the network. They don't want to have yeah. onesie twosie software on people's desk anymore. Jan, how about the network? Was there network hardware? Is there anything happening there to suggest the emergence of standards? The, uh, there's quite a bit happening in terms of uh, local area networks, but very little that actually suggests the emergence of standards. There are, you might say there are many, many standards <laughs> in the local area that's network. Uh, yeah, there's so many, you have your choice. The, Tim, that, that's also apparent in the uh, software that drives these laser printers. There's no, there's confusion there, isn't there? Yeah, the, uh, the company that's had the real jump on that is Adobe yes. <clears throat> with their PostScript. And of course, Apple picked that standard up. And then most recently, Hewlett Packard went to the Imogen product called DDL. And of course, one is the difference between the two is PostScript is a single page document at a time, where DDL is a full document and can be in multiple. What about the laser printers again on price? I mean, one of the things we hear, we've got to wait for those laser printer costs to come down so you can buy one, for instance, at 1,000 bucks. Then it becomes a printer everybody could buy. How far away are we from that? What were the prices of the laser printers newly introduced at Comdex? Well, the best we could find was somewhere between 16 and 1795. But now that Rico is going to challenge with some very big players uh, coming down the line, as well as Konica and a couple other engines that are coming out, there's no question within the next two years we'll probably see them break that uh, $1,500, $1,300 mm -hmm. price point. And by the time we get into 1989, it'll be under $1,000. The mood of the show was much more optimistic this year than last year, wasn't right. it? Very much so. Was. What do you people <coughs> feel next year holds for us in terms of where the industry is headed? Al? Well, I think we're going to see more of the same. I think that quite a few of the marginal companies have either dropped out or been bought by other people. Mm -hmm. I think that the show has reached what is probably its natural optimum size. It was about 90,000 people two years ago, and it was almost unwieldy. There was no cabs to be had. There were no <laughs> hotel rooms to be had. And, and that reflects, I mean, that says something. There's just too many people crowding in. Mm -hmm. At 80,000, which is the optimistic number, my, I would have put it maybe closer to 70,000, you had a full house, and every cab driver had a fare. I never heard a single complaint from any of the service people in Vegas. These are people that I, as a reporter, tend to listen to mm -hmm. to get a sense of, you know, is this crowd happy? So the yes, city people was were full, going out. The city was full. They were but eating not dinner, too full. but not overcrowded. What about on the floor, Jan? What was there? Were people selling things? Is there a legitimate upturn coming out of I this? I think there is a legitimate upturn. If you looked at the quality of the the people and of the questions that were being asked of the booth and of the reasons the questions were being asked, there was legitimate business that was being mm -hmm. done and legitimate interest in the products and um, plans, basically, of incorporating the products into the industry. Is there any general theme that we'll see next year? Well, I think the first thing is that, you know, a lot of people have been talking about the low end of the market mm -hmm. being established. Mm -hmm. And although the prices are there, mm -hmm. uh, the I don't really believe next year is a new user market. It's more likely to be the Fortune 2000, 3000 workers who have PCs on their desk and already have Buying established understanding. Mm -hmm. Replacement market. Uh, well, mm -hmm. replacement, but also possibly even taking it to, at home for the, for the sole purpose that they can do what they've done at work, take that disk home or whatever, which to me is probably the best networking solution you've got. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, they're going to drive that market strictly because they get they can buy this thing for eight nine hundred dollars now. Well, George, George, I've got to sure, stop you. I'm sure. afraid we're out of time. Tim, Jan, Hal, thank you very much. That's our Comdex special. We'll be back in just a minute with this week's computer news.
the random access file this week, despite the furor over the sale of U.S. military hardware to Iran, one U.S. company in Virginia is reportedly negotiating to sell computer war game software to Iraq. The company is called BDM International, and according to recently published reports, the company would provide Iraq with war game and simulation software that would make the Iraqi Air Force more effective against Iranian oil targets and the Iranian transportation system. The Reagan administration has created a new category for classifying government documents. The new category is called sensitive, and it means a document may not be placed in a computer database. Sensitive documents are not necessarily classified and can be accessed manually, but a Pentagon spokesman said the removal of sensitive documents from computer databases is designed to inhibit access to the documents by Soviet agents. What do an Activision spreadsheet, an SSI computer game, and a McGraw-Hill statistics program have in common? They were all written by a software firm in Shanghai, China. The Shanghai Software Consortium says it has 25 programmers on staff. They use IBM compatibles built in China. One major advantage of buying software from China, Chinese programmers make about $50 a month. A computerized pancreas has been implanted in a human patient for the first time at Johns Hopkins Hospital. The artificial pancreas can be reprogrammed by an external radio transmitter to alter the amount of insulin it delivers to the body based on the changing levels of the patient's activity and nutrition. Time for a look at software in this week's review from Paul Schindler. Well, you may say to yourself, it looks like Schindler has finally lost his marbles. I may have lost my marbles, but what I found is one of the best personal computer gift ideas ever, the toy shop. That award-winning paper airplane just happens to be the simplest thing you can make using the program. Now, first, you use the simple menu screens to tell Toy Shop which toy you want to make. The program then offers a simple diagram and description of the toy. If that's the one you really want, you're offered numerous chances to customize it. You can change the patterns or words on virtually any part of any toy. Finally, you hit the print button, and a really detailed toy is output to your printer. This is what the output of Toy Shop looks like. My example is the Starship. Here again is the finished product. All I needed was scissors, glue, and a paper clip. Toy Shop is a darn clever $65 idea from those innovative folks at Broderbund Software in San Rafael, California. For the Computer Chronicles, I'm Paul Schindler. The accounting firm of Coopers & Librand has developed a new expert system for giving tax advice. It's called ExpertTax, and it uses 2,000 rules gathered from the firm's top partners. The software will be distributed to Coopers & Librand offices around the country so that even a junior accountant in the boonies can give his client the same expertise that the partners are handing out to the big spenders in New York. There's a new wrinkle to telephone management software. A company called General Information has come out with Hotline, a telephone number database and dialer which includes 2,000 commonly used national phone numbers like airlines, hotels, and Fortune 500 companies. Hotline selling for $29.95. Finally, the case of the lonely computer in Lyons, Oregon. The mayor was surprised to get a $1,300 phone bill for a new phone line, which had been installed at the library so a personal computer there could access the library system's mainframe in Salem. Well, it seems the PC just kept on calling the mainframe, logging 87 hours worth of phone time in one month. While sentimentalists are saying the PC was just lonely to phone home, a systems analyst says it was just an unfortunate programming glitch. That's it for this week's Chronicles. We'll see you next time. The Computer Chronicles is made possible by Leading Edge, makers of IBM-compatible computer systems, including Lotus Lookalike Spreadsheet, word processing with spelling correction, communication software, and Hayes-compatible 1200 baud modem. Leading Edge, with over 1,000 service centers nationwide. Additional funding is provided by McGraw-Hill, publishers of Byte. Byte's detailed technical articles on new hardware, software, and languages cover developments in computer technology worldwide.